Hi, everyone, and welcome to Playtime Online. This is Institute of Play's webinar series that allows us to connect and share our work with you. I'm Amna Siddiqui, the producer of this program. Today, we're looking at five powerful learning games for students, particularly middle schoolers. We'll be exploring the constraints, considerations, and features that make these games great. We'll also talk about how you can implement some of these games mentioned today in your classroom, home, or after-school program. I want to mention that today's episode is part of Connected, Connected Educators Month, which celebrates the professional learning that happens when practitioners connect to each other through online communities and social networks. And for all of our Connected Educators watching this afternoon, you'll be able to claim your Connected Educator Month badge code at the end of this episode, so be sure to stick around for that. Now, let's meet today's participants. Could everybody briefly introduce themselves and say a few words about the work, uh, the work with, with students and, and learning that you do? Uh, Brendan, do you want to start? Uh, sure. So my name is Brendan Trombley. Uh, I'm a game designer with Institute of Play, and my main function is to work at our school called Quest to Learn and help develop game-like curriculum with the teachers and educators there. Um, that means I design games, game-like activities, uh, and just general, uh, general educational curriculum that can increase engagement, increase deeper understandings in the students. Uh, I'm also a uh, person who is involved in some of the informal learning around uh, Minecraft and parkour at the school. Cool, thanks. Uh, Liza? Sure. Hi, my name is Liza Stark. I am also a game designer at Quest to Learn. So pretty much do the same thing as Brendan um, and work with teachers to design game-like learning activities and games in and out of the Uma. Hi, everyone. I'm Uma Menon. I work with Glass Lab, uh, a division of Institute of Play. Glass Lab stands for Games for Learning and Assessment, and we create digital games um, either from scratch or uh, take existing games and modify it for the purposes of learning and assessment. And I'm stoked to be here. Great. And before we get started, I want to remind our viewers that at any point you'd like to ask today's speakers questions, just click on that blue participate text under this video on the right-hand side, uh, because we'll be spending the last 15 minutes of the webinar answering questions during a Q&A portion. So uh, let's begin today's conversation talking about what makes a game good. Uh, Brendan, I'm wondering if you could uh, kind of walk us through how, how you go about identifying um, the, the best games for learning, and, and what are some of the essential components? Right. Um, so if you're looking at a, at a digital game, there's a few things that come straight to mind when, when I think of the, the best ones. Um, the first and foremost thing is uh, any game that has some sort of creative control for the player, uh, some sort of way to really express yourself and to take ownership over your experience in your world, uh, is a really important factor in having a learning game. That allows both um, students to create content, and it also actually allows for teachers to can produce content and experiences for their learners uh, if they can tailor them towards specific learning goals. Um, it's kind of a back and forth. Uh, I also like games that have some sort of open-ended problem-solving spaces, um, uh, games that uh, have a kind of a scaffolded uh, learning environment where it starts very simple and gets you know more complex as you go. Um, these are all features that generally pop right into my head. Uh, of course, certain games out there can also be very naturally uh, aligned towards specific content areas. You know, the uh, civilization type games are, can be very good for social studies. Um, a lot of strategy games can be good for uh, math and kind of so on like that. So sometimes you can think of genre and how they map out to specific uh, subjects or content areas as well. I don't know if uh, Liza or Uma, you had any other input there. Perhaps no. No. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so, how about we go ahead and, and dive into what we've all been waiting for: um, our, our five learning game recommendations for middle schoolers. So, Uma, uh, could you start us off with with the first game, uh, which is an algebra game called Dragon Box? Sure. Um, so Dragon Box, I, I mean, like, I chose this because, like, you know, for several of the reasons that Brenton just mentioned, it has a complex problem space, but it's, but still has a very low barrier to entry, um, 
and i would like to start with a screen share of like you know a small um, video of like you know, how the first level of it goes so that i can re really see uh, you can really see how easy it is to get into the game and like you know progress through it so dragon box uh, 12 plus like you know they have two uh, they have two versions of dragon box one for the younger kids and one for the middle school we'll focus on the uh, the one for the middle school age children here and even it it starts with um, the concept uh, there's a storyline behind the uh, behind the game that it has so let me pause this video while I give you an idea of the storyline. It's about a dragon um, who wants to be alone. Like you know, it's a, it's an egg in, in a box, and it has to grow into a dragon by eating all these food. And the food items it it is presented at, uh, as like uh, as as the numbers or the variables would appear in an um, in an equation. So there are obviously two sides. To the equation, and like you know, the kids don't need to know any anything about an equation or a math or a number when they are starting to play with it. All they know need to know is that this red box right there is a drag, it's a dragon's box, and they actually need to start eating all the food so that the dragon can grow. Right now, it is just an egg, and like you know, soon it's going to the box is going to open it up. So how how well you can do it is also matched in it. So in some of in part of the video you probably saw that like you know how many moves it it actually takes, and depending on the number of moves you actually get a score. So the game mechanics are like the the thing that gets gets kids into these kind of games is like you know uh, understanding. It's very quickly to understand like you know how to win and how and and the uh, and the purposeful uh, nature of things, uh, pro progression of things. So, um, if you if you saw that just that move itself, like it kind of showed like um, so in the screen right now you have a black five uh, five digit uh, dice side or what they call a card or like you know I I tend to use it as images and a white side. So it's very inherent in our brain that like you know okay black and white like you know, it kind of uh, mixed together and something happens and it the image looks the same but like you know it looks right opposite and eventually the concept of like you know addition subtraction all is blended into this and when you bring together as you can see in the video when you bring together the uh, the black one and the white one you get a zero or something that like you know get uh, that just gets nullified so if you if you watch it you can see that the black goes on the white and then it then you can just tap it away so you can see that again with with different with different images whether it be number or the images it goes to the same thing and as you progress through the levels eventually you get to a, uh, get to a place where you're comfortable with with all these operations they actually introduce the dragon the dragon box itself becomes the actual x or the y and um, or the different types of variables and it really demonstrates to you that numbers are like you know what or equations as 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 such, I mean they can they can all be considered as like you know one object, and it's all it's all thinking about them in terms of that. So I want to switch switch from this from to a, to a small presentation. So as I said, like you know, the Dragon Box. Uh, what stood out for me when I played through Dragon Box is it's a very simple storyline. Um, even like you know, a five-year-old can understand the storyline. They're very used to dragons being in the uh, in in their games or in their storybooks. The graphics is very appealing to the to the younger generation, um, as well as very clear when like you know the the different colors that you saw was like you know really making it distinct that like you know, what, what should go where, um, so there was no confusion about it. Uh, the game mechanics are very easy to learn. So uh, I I played it on the iPad primarily, 
and it's also available on PC and uh, Mac. But uh, I can speak to, like, about the iPad. Like there is no complicated swishes or anything like that. The most complicated it gets is like double tap and tap and slide, and that to the advanced levels. So initially everything is just like you know, holding something and moving it somewhere. Um, the two sides of the equation go moving from one to the other, um, and just tapping it. So there's a very compelling progression. Like you know, there are ten chapters laid out. Each of the chapters gives you small powers. Each like you know, pro progressively more and more complex powers. So initially, all you can do is, like, you know, in math words, it's only addition or like you know, grouping things together on one side, and then soon you are able to, like, you know, mix and ma mix those different colors together, and like, you know, flip the sides. Then it comes comes to like, you know, fractions. You can actually move when when you move one image over the other, or one number over the other, or one. In my in this case, like, you know, when uh, when you uh, when you talk in the dragon's terms, it's it's a different food that it's going to eat. So one food, you can bring different foods from on on below, and like you know, if you put it as a fraction, and it automatically makes sure that like you know the other um, other sides of the equation also get balanced out. So there are simple mechanisms to do all these things, and without realizing, children are tending to learn like you know how to make fractions and how it gets applied to the different sides of the equation. There is also the concept of like you know the helping the kids through the uh, through the game and through understanding, and if somebody gets stuck somewhere, like you know they can all see the solution and then go back and do it and like you know get there. And there is and there is no penalization for like you know repeat trying. You can always try harder, and there um, it's it all keeps track of how many moves you are actually t using to. Uh, to arrive at the equation, uh, arrive at the solution. So, for if we, if you're arriving at the solution in an optimal way, you get the you get the most stars. Um, the other thing that gets rated is how simplified your equation is. How sim So, if you leave some um, some things that could actually be combined in uh, like you know simplified, then the dragon actually says like you know yuck. And instead, like, you know, your uh, the scores get affected by that. And what I saw was like you know when I was playing this with other kids and like, I was watching them play, like that had a profound impact on them. Oh, the, my dragon said yuck, and that meant that like you know something is wrong. I want to go back and try again. And that sort of compulsion, like you know, and that sort of uh, really encouraging the children to like, you know think optimally and like you know make it, make it successful and. Without penalizing them, like you know, the, their number of attempts doesn't inc decrease their scoring or anything. So they are actually encouraged to go back and repeat it and like you know make it perfect. Um, the other part that I really like it's some sometimes the child is able to solve it in fewer moves than they anticipated, and they then they get like you know this extra uh, just the fact that like, it shows up a bubble and says that wow you solved in fewer moves and I saw like you know the joy in children's eyes of oh, yeah I'm like I'm good, getting good at this now I can like you know do more so it really has a clear and compelling progression and each chapter as I said like you know gives you different t little powers like from addition to subtraction to multiplication like you know the concept of identity the concept of like you know commutative pro property all these are all these are introduced at the right levels. So after you progress through all the all the ten chapters, you can also go back and like you know, there's a whole set of practices which actually uses the equations like you know x plus a and like you know all those kind of normal uh, notations that we are used to while teaching algebra. Um, this one of the screen, um, like you know the the star screen as as I saw you like, you know, it says yum and like, you know uh, I could see that like simple te uh, terminologies like this and the, the way it was being conveyed had a profound impact on the child that is using it. So what I feel like Dragon Box teaches, um, teaches the children really well is the concepts of equality, the concept of fractions. Mm, as I mentioned, like you, know, you can drag it and like you know, it forces you to drag it to all the pieces of like you know, data or like you know, numbers or food pieces in this case that you have on the screen. Um, it for it really gets into the properties of zero that like you know zero it's up 
at uh, at anywhere you can like tap it and like you know it doesn't affect you properties of one that like you know you can tap tap one and then like you know it just merges in uh, if it is a multiplication so if, um, it is very very subtle like you know very clear and but uh, yet again very uh, very solid ways of con conveying this thing um, conveying these operations as well like you know multiplication is like a tight bond between the two two numbers or however many numbers or how many food uh, boxes that there are um, inversion as we saw in the video it's like you know between black and white between the color colors are so starkly different at the same time like you know very very visually opposite um, it grows into the stage where like you know it actually introduces parameters and like you know there is uh, the concept of parenthesis and how think you can group things together and make your own food and like you know um, how how that increases your chance of getting a better score and while playing through it um, what I felt like you know what from an educator's point of view um, what is the most powerful is like you know if you if you let a ch child um, like you know, run through the whole thing without even having to think about like uh, math equations or like you know x y uh, any of the algebra or any of the algebraic terms, and then actually go through and like you know at certain levels, like ask the child to explain or like you know say and if they have trouble explaining like you know, really make them understand why these certain of certain moves are not allowed like why does the dragon not get to eat certain things why does why can't one food move over the other if it is not compatible like so there are there are these kind of questions and uh, like you know, which can be really thought provoking to the kids and then you can translate it to numbers and the the progression and the steps that you go through will really help to think think the child uh, to make the make the child think through all these steps that they have to communicate in a mathematical um, like, uh, uh, equa uh, so mathematical solution. Sometimes um, that's a limitation of being a video game. Like you know, some semi-automatic updates happen, right? I mean, you you tap on something and like you know, it disappears. But in real world or like you know, in with real numbers, you have to really understand why it is disappearing, and like you know, why that why is zero like you know. Uh, uh, what is the power of zero? What is the power of one? Why does tapping one, you know, uh, make it makes it disappear, like you know, make the one disappear and leaves the identity? Like, what is the concept of identity? And like you know, why is it so? So all these things, all these questions can, at the time that um, each power is granted, these questions can be discussed. They can be like you know, moved into a paper and. Uh, pen format and like you know work through with, with similar problems but I think the concepts um, are introduced in a very very subtle way and in a very powerful way so that like you know it's very easy to retain for the children to and, and to understand and I have actually like you know uh, I have two kids uh, 7 and 12 um, the 12 year old already understood the concept of algebra so I could see that she was solving the the math problems very differently than my son who who is like you know having fun with it dragging it different places but then like you know really gets a joy once once he understands and like you know I just related it to numbers he hasn't gone through the whole thing but like uh, but I could see where it can lead to um, this is a claim that they make it on their website like you know after four hours the children start doing these kind of equations and I like from what I've seen, like oh, it's one of those products which I felt like you know that claim is absolutely right. So, I, Amna, I think like you know that's awesome. Thank you. Great. So, Liza, do you want to talk about today's second theme, which is the puzzle game Scribble Knots? Sure. Okay, so Scribble Knots is a super unique game, and it's very cool, and you can get lost in it for hours. Um, basically, it's an emergent puzzle game in which you um, solve challenges by basically summoning words to give you objects that will help you solve these challenges. So I'm going to mirror my iPad really quickly. So um, this is basically this is the first level that you go through, and let's just start off at level one so you can get an idea of 
what the mechanic and the gameplay looks like. So we're going to start this level. So we have Maxwell here. And Maxwell likes to go into lots of different worlds and encounter lots of different problems. So we have a hint. All we have to do is cut down the tree and grab the real star right. So not any sort of set rules, just an idea of what we need to do in order to be able to get points. So I'm going to hit OK. And then you can see that we have this notepad. So I'm going to click the notepad. And I'm going to type in axe. So I'm going to drag the, drag the axe over to Maxwell. It's going to come down. And I'm going to click him, and he's going to chop down the tree. And then that means that he gets a well, start. So, and then my level's complete. Um, and you can keep moving forward in levels. So I'm going to share another presentation with you guys because the iPad gets a little slow. We start talking about the other levels and why this can be a powerful tool for learning. So, um, so first off, one reason that this is really um, a great tool is that it gives a lot of opportunities for different vocabulary practice and just word usage, right? If you have to, if we have this summoning mechanic or this imagination mechanic. Um, students or learners, kids have to pull words from you know, wherever in their brains and, and actually activate it and use it to solve this challenge. So here we have a, um, an early level where they have to refresh the sky that's stuck in the desert, which you can do in a variety of ways, right? You can give them a glass of water, you can give them a shower, you can make a tsunami come, lots of different things that you can do. So it's really this what-if ability to bring anything into the world that makes this really, really compelling um, and also can be a really powerful way to help learners practice um, their work. So another reason why this, um, I'm just going to go to the next level. So there are lots of different points of access um, that you can use in this game. So it's not like you necessarily need to have um, mastery over a, a super wide range of, of words and vocabulary, right? You can use anything that's, or you can use any types of words that are sort of up to your, your level. And, um, so it can be much more self-guided and you, you can work at your own pace. Uh, I mean, if we're sort of, when we position that says a learning tool to be used in the classroom, right? So let's keep going down to another level just to show you. And I'm, you've probably gotten the idea by now that the words that we're summoning are all nouns, and they're all concrete nouns. Um, we will be able to change that, and or that will change in a second, but we'll get there in a minute. So um, this is Maxwell's in the government, so he needs uh, objects in three different categories. So then you have this idea of creating different buckets and, and bringing in lots of different types of words. Um, so then we can, once we move forward enough, we, can, we reach the adjective level, where um, you can say, in this level specifically, they're trying to find um, potions to give this man standing on the stool uh, the qualities of the dragon. So you can give him a potion that says um, green skin or fire-breathing skills. Like, you can use lots of different combinations. So it's really, so ScribbleNuts has this really great way of offering multiple solutions to the same problem. Um, and it leads to lots of emergent solutions, right? So it's kind of been called like um, an emergent puzzle game by a lot of reviewers and, and players. Um, let's see what else we've got in terms of levels to highlight. Uh, so this is another one with adjectives, and once again, just sort of um, practicing, like I said, concrete nouns. Um, so this is where uh, different characters will run across the screen, and Maxwell has to give them a car that matches their, uh, their character. So this is Red Riding Hood, so we give her, of course, a red convertible, and then she gets in and goes away. Um, so to bring this into more of a classroom context, you can kind of think about a lot of different ways that you might be able to implement this. Um, 
So, uh, first of all, it's great to sort of practice in reinforcement within um, or outside of a classroom, outside of a classroom project. Um, and so inside of a classroom, you can do lots of different things like um, giving specific word banks. For instance, in one of our classes, we're working on a prototype around an activity that would involve just giving them, uh, giving students um, a set of specific words that they would then have to use. Um, so this could also be especially helpful in sort of the context of um, uh, an English language learning classroom, or even just learning a foreign language, it comes. It's available in a variety of different languages. I believe German, French, Spanish, Italian, lots of different things. Um, so this is really just a really fun and great, great tool for um, students to be able to practice bringing in their um, their vocabulary and building building skills, and just like really take the challenge of um, solving a level in multiple ways and really exercising um, creative problem solving skills. Great. So Liza, do you have anything anything else to present uh, with with scribble knots? Um. Uh, no, I think that's it for now. That's it. Okay. Great. So our, our third game today is another puzzle game, uh, but it's pretty different from Scribble Knots. Uh, Brendan, can you talk about Portal 2 and uh, its level editor? Absolutely. So Portal 2 is probably one of my favorite games of all time, so I'm really excited that I get to talk about it here. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about it, and then I'm going to show you guys some visuals. Uh, Portal 2 it's a uh, first-person game in which they kind of explore this idea of, like, what if you had the ability to open, like, a window in, in, in time and space and then open a second window that is a window to the first window, and therefore you have a portal from one space to another where objects can pass instantly through one and out the other. And, you know, video games are a great place to sort of explore these what-if questions that you can't really... Uh, accomplish in any other way without, you know, breaking the laws of physics. Um, so Portal it takes that, identi or that idea and creates a puzzle game around it. You're in your, in your first person mode and you have uh, a special thing called a portal gun which allows you to place portals on walls. You get to have a blue portal and an orange portal and they're linked together, which means objects can pass through one portal and out the other. And you solve puzzles using this unique tool. So let me just uh, do a sc screen share to talk a little bit about Portal 2. Okay, I just want to make sure that you guys see what I want you to see. Perfect, okay. Uh, even the logo uh, shows you a little bit of this concept. You have this uh, orange and blue thing going on where uh, it looks like a person is running through this portal in one side and out the other instantaneously. Um, for those of you who are not uh, familiar with this style of gameplay, Portal is a bit mind-bending. Here we're looking at a view of the game in which two portals are facing each other, so that character is both looking at themselves from behind while being inside of their own point of view. Uh, that's by placing one portal uh, across from each other in a hallway. Uh, and this is one of the first things that I think makes Portal a very good mind, uh, mind game, a learning game. It's also a mind game. It, it, it makes you, um, it, really, it really makes you think in a new way that, that doesn't really exist in, anywhere in real life. And it allows you to take these new problems and really chew on them. And it gives you puzzles that, that explore the sort of implications of having this ability to, to make these portals. Um, so what it does, what we do is you get uh, up some sort of problem space, and this is this is the second thing. It's a complex problem space that is also uh, very easy to um, try and fail. Um, if if something goes wrong in the game, it's usually very easy to restart and try again. So it really encourages users to experiment and try different uh, strategies on how to solve the problem. So you might have to pick up a cube, 
put it on, on a red button, it might open a door, you might have to have multiple cubes, multiple red buttons to open the doors, and so on and so on. Um, so learners get to, get to experiment, they get to try new things, and uh, they get to really feel accomplished once they've figured out the puzzle and move on. Uh, and uh, it's just a very great environment to be putting your students into because it really allows them to uh, try and not fear failure. Uh, from a more content-specific angle, uh, Portal is very physics-friendly. Um, the certain things are preserved between the portals, such as momentum. So this shows a quick diagram of a character who is going to use gravity to, to speed up and fall into the blue portal. And because they're falling at a high speed, once they come out of the orange portal, they have enough momentum to launch themselves onto this platform that they wouldn't have normally been able to get onto. Um, this whole conservation of momentum thing is one of the, the most fun parts of, of Portal, and it's a, a great thing to uh, include in any sort of physics kind of uh, curriculum. Uh, the thing that probably excites me the most about Portal, though, is the fact that it has a level editor. And, and, and this is Portal 2. Portal 1, unfortunately, did not have a level editor, but uh, Portal 2 did get one. And this is where... Uh, in the Quest to Learn family of schools, we have done some exploration of, of bringing the game into, directly into the classroom. Um, in our science curriculum, the students have used the portal editor to make their own levels and then make predictions on how people might uh, interact with that level. For instance, one student wanted to, was exploring uh, the hypothesis that students would... Um, shoot many, many different portals. He was, he was making a prediction on how many portals a student might shoot while playing through his level. So he made a hypothesis, and then he had students play through his level while he observed them and took data, and got to see whether his hypothesis, uh, the, the results matched his hypothesis. Um, and this is, this is what I was saying earlier, is, is games that give you some sort of creative control, some sort of way to express yourself, is a very, very powerful learning tool. Uh, the, the portal level editor system allows people to not just become uh, consumers of content, you know, the content that was created by the designers of portal, but they can then move into the shoes of a designer and try out making content themselves and then sharing it with other users. Um, I haven't uh, experienced it myself, so I'm not sure exactly how accessible this is, but I'm pretty sure there's a way for uh, users to share their levels with um, all the other portal players that are out there. Um, Lastly, I want to just talk about was that this is this is an extension of what that student was was doing. Uh, portal could be a source of data. Here is his results, his graph of how many times different users shot a portal while he was testing the level. And so, based on this, he got to come to you know come to certain conclusions about um, the behaviors of certain players, whether they're good at portal or bad at portal, how that affected their behavior, and so on. And so. I thought that was very interesting to see that um, both the play of the game and then the design of, of levels of the game interacted with each other in the classroom and created uh, both, both a fun, uh, self-directed learning space in which kids were learning both inside the game and outside the game. And that's all I have to say about Portal. Cool. Thanks, Brendan. So, um, Liza, could you talk about our next game, which is Game Star Mechanic? And, uh, and for our viewers, this game teaches kids about game design and systems thinking. Sure. So Game Star Mechanic is, so actually it is a game, but it is also um, a game to teach, as Anna said, um, players about how to design a game. So let's, I'm going to start a screen share with you guys. Oops, hold on a sec. Okay, we're going to go meta for a second because I'm going to another tab in my box. So, there we go. Oh, whoa. That is very meta. Let's try this. There we go. Okay, so Game Star Mechanic is... Basically, so yeah, it's a game to help um, that teaches you how to design games. So players enter and they take on this role of designers by first playing and then creating their own games. So 
it engages them in a lot of um, systems thinking, design thinking, um, and it's basically 21st century skills in a box that can be adapted and used in lots of different ways. So I'm just going to take you through this really quickly. Um, let me go back to my tab. So when you first enter, you are a player that is charged with saving this world, this steampunk-inspired world, from this rogue game designer. You have to create and repair and fix games in order for, um, for this world to be back in balance. And along the way, you learn about different game design principles, and you gather different components that you can use to create your own games. So I'll just take you through. So you start in the factory, and you have to go through all of these different levels. Oop, Eliza, we can't hear you anymore. OK, well, um, let's see here. How about we move on to our, our next game while Eliza uh, gets her, her computer in up different and working? Areas. Oh, there you are. Eliza? Sorry? Yes. Hi. Um, we didn't hear the, the last maybe minute of what you said. OK. All right. Can you, and you can hear me now, though? Yes. Yep. OK, great. So uh, I think I stopped maybe at, um, so when you enter in as a player, you enter into the factory. And in the factory, you get to, there we go, you go on different quests. Right, so you go on these different missions to play games. And once you, and all the while, it's this uh, game store mechanic really encourages this sort of meta reflection. So it's basically teaching you how to design, how to look, how to play by looking at a game with the eyes of a designer. So then you play the game, uh, and it gives you All right, I'll go ahead and exit out of it. OK. Can you guys hear me OK? Yes. No? OK, sorry. I think my computer just did something weird. So I'll go ahead and start. So once, so right, so you enter the factory, and you start playing, and you learn how to start thinking like a designer. And so you gather this toolkit, and as you do, um, once you've collected enough components to start winning, um, you can start making your own games. So, um, so you're practicing critical thinking through play, right? So another sort of reason that it, this is a very, very powerful tool for learning is you start thinking about design thinking. So what you're looking at now is a picture of a paper prototype of a game that, um, young, that some young people made and came up with. Uh, during a challenge in Minneapolis. So also, GameStar Mechanic has been deployed in thousands of schools and after-school programs with great success. Um, and a lot of times, it is built into a larger program. So you can kind of have this more blended model with GameStar Mechanic, where, uh, like we do, we have a course called Sports for the Mind that we use GameStar Mechanic in um, during one unit for sixth grade. and they use it, they work on their games, they use class time to work on their games, and then they play the games outside of school for homework. Um, or you can sort of take it to a more out of school context, an informal context, and actually walk through the design process, going from concept to paper, prototype, playtesting, to actually building out the digital game. Right, so this is the next iteration of their paper prototype, where they're actually taking these components and seeing how they can be physically moved around, just to sort of simulate the way that the components would be moved around in the game. So lots of playtesting and iteration happens before they even move to the digital part of it. Now, once you're done playtesting um, uh, your paper prototypes, and you've walked through all of the games within GameStar Mechanic, then you move on to starting um, 
to start building your own games. And you take all of the components and all of the challenges that you have gone through and learned along the way and start to build your own game. So once, and so also, aside from design thinking, there is also a lot of systems thinking that's happening, right? So as you're moving through the design process uh, of playing and then uh, starting to design, you start to find these patterns and relationships and you have a better understanding for how these components work together, right? What are different, how do different blocks interact with each other? What is the goal of the game? How do you provide enough challenge for the player to have them reach the goal of the game um, and still make it an engaging and meaningful experience? So at the zoomed in level, you start to think about user interaction and how that makes the system change, how um, that makes it more dynamic, how these components inter interrelate. Um, and then sort of at this higher level, um, you can, it also becomes a tool for self-expression when you think about the narrative layers that you can add to this game that, that sort of create this need to, need to play, if you will. Um, here are some other screenshots of games that, uh, that you have developed. Um, so then there's uh, definitely a high social learning aspect to game star mechanic because they're, um, once players do complete their games, complete build, uh, finish building their games, um, if they are deemed beatable, actually, and not um, broken, they are put up onto um, Game Alley, which is where uh, different players of Game Star Mechanic can go to actually test out and try their peers' games. Um, and they can also receive feedback. So this, now I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, the way that we use Game Star Mechanic here at Quest. So like I said before, we have a class called Sports for the Mind. And in sixth grade, so this is basically like um, a digital media arts class uh, or kind of like an ICT class um, that uses a lot of STEM, STEAM types of, um, types of project-based learning. So they start off with Game Star Mechanic once they get into Quest. Uh, it's one of the first things that they do in Sports for the Mind. So they, this is an image of them sort of having their game jam, right? So we actually start, as I said before, not digitally. They do begin by playing games, but they first start by making their own games, their own paper games, paper prototypes. Um, and they do things like make a board game. So you can see here is a checklist that the teacher uses to make sure that they have hit all of the, the components that they need, uh, or all of the criteria that they need. Um, so another great thing about Game Star Mechanic, the way that it was designed was explicitly to teach people how to design games, um, and specifically within a learning context. So there is this whole great learning guide that was built for educators where you have an introduction to Game Design 101. So you don't have to sort of walk blindly if you're an educator who wants to implement this within um, a learning context into game design if you don't feel, if you're not necessarily sure exactly what the nitty gritty is. Um, it gives, it's talks about the design elements, about systems thinking. It offers different uh, units, sort of thinking about these big ideas and guiding questions. And there's also a field guide, which is a great way, um, it's a great resource that uh, shows different ways of connecting content to Game Star Mechanics. So here's a Deep Earth Explorer um, sort of lesson, right? But then there's also one that's House on Mango Street. So it's really, really great um, sort of in the flexibility that it has to adapt to different types of subject levels, you know, subject areas and domain areas. Um, and just in general, sort of going back to that idea of creative output and, and self-expression and the just gratification of being able to create this game and seeing it as the, the greater product of, of the learning that's happened as you progress through these levels of play. And that's Game Star Mechanic. Great. Thanks, Liza. So we are now on our fifth and final learning game. Uh, Brendan, do you want to talk about Minecraft? Okay, I will, and uh, hopefully I'll do it very fast so we still have question, time for questions at the end. So let's very quickly get to the presentation. All right, so we're going to talk about Minecraft. Now, um, if you're an educator who educates middle schoolers or possibly has 
uh, a middle schooler aged kid at home, you've probably heard of this game if you're not already familiar with it completely. Um, so, but first I'm going to tell you a little bit about what it is so that uh, those of you who are unfamiliar can uh, have a bit of an understanding. Minecraft is an open-ended game. Uh, it is probably one of the most open-ended games I have ever experienced. Basically, it's a world in which uh, every aspect of it has been broken down into cubes. Uh, so as you can see here, it's got a very blocky looking feeling. What makes it very interesting is that you, you as a player are able to both remove cubes from this world and add cubes back into the world, whether they're dirt, wood, leaves, stone, kind of anything that you want. And because of this, you, are, you have the power to reshape this world in any way that you want to. Uh, it's, it, a lot of people might consider it like uh, digital Legos, but it goes beyond Lego because the blocks have different interactions uh, between each other, and there are you know moving entities such as animals and, <laughs> and other types of of things that that have different interactions between each other in the game. So you have these sort of this potential for both uh, completely open-ended freedom to create whatever you want, and also creating these interesting interactions and systems between uh, different uh, entities in the game. Uh, Minecraft is very creative. Um, Hold on a second. Sorry about that, guys. All right, I'm back. Um, Minecraft is creative, so the ability to reshape the world in any way that you want to gives you the uh, gives players the ability to create any kind of architecture or or sculpture or anything that they want to. Uh, what it basically becomes is a very accessible. Um, kind of 3D tool. Um, you know, in previous 3D tools, you know, you might have to deal with polygons and vertexes and all these other things. Whereas in Minecraft, it's very abstracted and it's just blocks, and that makes it so much easier to, to put things together. So what you're seeing right here is actually a series of buildings that uh, students at our school have created in a, a multiplayer environment. Uh, that's another thing I wanted to mention was that Minecraft is uh, collaborative. Um, people can join a world together and uh, work together to build. Uh, structures or build anything that they want to. Minecraft players build systems. Um, a big aspect of the game is uh, scarcity of resources, especially if you're playing in what's called survival mode. You actually have to collect resources to use them. Um, so you, your, your character has to deal with certain hazards in the world, such as hunger or damage or monsters and things like that. And what it, that does is motivate the player to create systems that alleviate the different challenges in the game. So here you see uh, a complex farming system that uh, a player has designed in order to have a, a steady supply of food. Um, there are plenty of other systems that Minecraft players might build to collect other types of resources. Minecraft is also very teacher usable because it's such an open-ended tool. Um, a teacher can, can go in and create their own 3D environment for their students to play through. And I'm actually going to show you a live version of that in just a moment. But this is a, a kind of an experiment that I did um, some, some time ago where uh, I created a Cartesian coordinate kind of grid puzzle where students were, were finding clues as to which uh, Cartesian coordinate to dig at on this sort of large grid on the floor there. And if they dug in the correct spots, they would be able to uh, find a treasure room and get you know, some, a reward. Um, so I want to uh, show you a recent version of a teacher-created Minecraft uh, thing. Oh, actually, I want to show you one other thing before I do that. Uh, so I have to switch my screen share to a different window. Actually, no, I'm just going to go straight to the live demo because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, this is for our 10th grade high school, uh, or I'm sorry, 9th grade living environment. Which, in which um, the teacher, in, in cooperation with the game designer, created a model of a cell. So what you're seeing here is the interior of a cell. That big thing in the middle is a nucleus. You see a few other things. The smaller things floating are, represent ribosomes, and the green, larger ones represent mitochondria. Now the students in this challenge have to enter this world, and they're tasked with actually extracting DNA from the cell. Um, and they're given various tools, which in Minecraft language are an axe, a pickaxe, and shears, but we have renamed those objects to represent 
uh, the chemicals that you need to break down the uh, various aspects of the cell to reach into the nucleus. So an axe chops wood, but in cell terms, this wood here actually represents the cell membrane. So a cell membrane is made out of fats and uh, soap. Oops. Um, oh, I pick that up. It says soap. Soap is what's used to break down and isolate fats. Uh, if you go farther into the cell, you get to the uh, protein casing around the DNA, and you need a pickaxe to tackle that. So you need to use salt to break down those proteins, and eventually you need to extract the DNA using the DNA extractor. So this is just an example of the kind of thing a teacher might make for students to experience the learning in an in a immersive way. Now you can also imagine students creating environments and models to demonstrate that they have the learning as well. So it's kind of a, a, an amazing tool both for teachers and for students to uh, get at the learning. Um, so yeah, with that, I think I'm good with Minecraft. Uh, it's a very, very, very big subject, so um, there, there, there's a, there are many things to explore with Minecraft that um, you should totally share, you should totally look into if, you're, if this interests you at all. So that's all. Cool. And Brendan, do you have any suggested resources for people who might be interested in, in looking into it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just turn off the screen sharing. So one of the best resources that we have found in our work is um, a modified version of Minecraft called Minecraft EDU. And what that does is give teachers many different tools to both create content and to um, run Minecraft worlds in their classroom. It gives them the control to freeze students, to move them around the world, to load and unload different maps very easily. Um, and, it, and it provides it, it, it provides all in a very uh, graphically intuitive way. So teachers who might not have as much technical skill to make that sort of thing happen normally, Minecraft TDU gives them the tools they need to do that. <laughs> cool, thanks. And I just want to quickly review uh, all of the games we've touched on. Uh, this afternoon. So we, we first looked at Dragon Box, then we looked at Scribblenauts, Portal 2 and its level editor, then GameStar Mechanic, and then finally Minecraft. So um, thanks for sharing your games, everyone. Uh, so I think it's a good time to, to jump into the Q&A. We don't really have a lot of time, but, um, but remember our audience, if you would like to ask our speakers questions, um, just click on the blue participate text uh, on the right hand side under this video. Uh, so our, our first question comes from Eric, and he, he asks, I'm assuming none of these games are intended to replace classroom learning, but rather complement it. Given this, at what point in my unit plan do I introduce a game like Portal 2 to my class? Uh, I mean, you're absolutely right that none of these games are intended to re replace classroom learning. Um, we always integrate it with a lar in, within a larger context of learning. Uh, for instance, the portal thing, you know, had both the data collection aspect and the hypothesizing and all those sort of post and pre activities. And portal was one part of like the larger picture. Um, so, in your in, in terms of your unit plan, it really takes uh, kind of a holistic approach in figuring out um, what's your learning goal and how does this game how does this game get at your learning goal? Is it is it a practice space? Is it going to introduce new content? Um, is it an assessment? Uh, these are all things that will, the, all, these questions are going to be the things that kind of determine where the game is situated. Um, generally, I like to use games as like a practice space and also games that have some sort of creative output like Minecraft are really good assessments, uh, things that can be delivered and then used as a, a way to demonstrate understanding. Did you guys have any other thoughts? Okay, great. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, is from Albert, and uh, he <laughs> asks, are any of these games free, and can any be played uh, or taught on a smart board? So actually, yes. Um, so Minecraft is totally free. Um, Game Star Mechanic is also totally free. Uh, Scribblenauts, I believe, is 99 cents. Um, uh, Dragon Box, I'm not totally sure. Uma, do you know? I know that it's an. App. I know that the app is probably. Yeah, yeah the app is ten dollars. Ten dollars. Okay. Yeah, but I'm. Uh, I'm. I haven't looked at, as I mentioned at the PC and Mac versions, and they may have educator discounts as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Dragon Box is a little bit more expensive, but. Um, and I have seen Dragon Box, um, like you know, with the iPad to smart smart board connection being used that way. 
Yeah, and, and as far as the smart board goes, definitely there are lots of, you can absolutely mirror all of these to your smart board. Um, and Portal, Brendan, I'm not totally sure the place on that. Uh, I believe there's a, oops, you might want to mute. Um, I believe that there is a, a free educational version of Portal available. Um, that you can look into. Um, maybe we can post, if we find that link, post it in the resources afterwards. And I wanted to clarify, Minecraft is actually not free. It costs it costs money per account. Um, Minecraft DBU actually allows you to buy licenses at a reduced price, though. OK, and then uh, our, our next question is from Tyler. And he asks, uh, what other games did you want to include today that you couldn't? Yeah, that's a good question because yeah, we had to talk about uh, all the, the whole list that we had and, and pare them down. Uh, one of them I remember talking about was Crayon Physics, which is a, a game that gives you physics problem and you actually have to draw the shapes that you want to put into the problem. It's like a 2D space. So if you if you need like a, a ramp, you actually draw a ramp onto the screen and it plops down into, into space and sort of this like sketchy crayon version. Um, what, else, what else did we talk about? World of Goo. It's another physics game. Yeah, World of Goo, it gives you puzzles where you have to kind of create these architectural 2D kind of uh, from these like goo creatures and, 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 and draw build a structure out of the goo creatures that gets to a goal. It's very fun. Yeah. Another physics one was Algadoo. I don't remember that. Liza, do you want to talk about that one? Uh, sure. So Algadoo is sort of just like a physics simulator um, where you can build different types of structures and then simulate water fall, what it looks like when water falls out of a bucket and then gravity sort of pulls its way down over a, another object. So it's really cool and really fun. Great. So that's actually all we have time for. If we didn't answer your question, um, please check the, the comment section in the next couple of days and uh, we'll be sure to, to answer your question. So, so feel free to keep keep the questions coming. Um, so for our connected educators watching, your badge code is 5ING99. Again, that's the number 5, I as in Ivan, as N as in Nancy, G as in Garth, 99. And you can visit badges.connectededucators.org and enter the badge code to collect your badge and, and put it in your backpack. And we'll also be posting uh, the badge code on this page temporarily. So in case you missed it, um, you can just check back on this page in about 10 minutes, and um, it'll be posted right under this video along with all of the games we talked about and, and the resources that Brendan uh, mentioned for Minecraft. So uh, please join us for the next episode of Playtime Online, which is tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Glass Lab will be exploring how they're using data from the summer SimCity EDU Alpha Pilot to assess uh, systems thinking. And um, I, I quickly want to note that tomorrow is the first of three special webinars that have been created to celebrate the launch of, of Glass Lab's new game, a SimCity EDU Pollution Challenge. And, and that comes out on November 7th. So for updates on Playtime Online, sign up for our mailing list. Just click Join Us at the top of this page. Thank you for watching, everyone. And if you like what we're doing, please spread the word. Have a great evening. Bye, guys. Thank you for joining. <laughs>